Ariel, hi, hello, welcome to the Female Startup Club podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to jump in and talk all things parachute with you. I always love to start by getting you to give the elevator pitch for your brand. Sure. So Parachute is a modern home essentials brand. We design and manufacture um, all sorts of cozy products for every room in your home. We've been around for about eight years and are really passionate about creating a more comfortable home. Everyone needs a more comfortable home. I feel like the pandemic has showed us <laughs> that we need luxury in every, every corner of the house these days. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, our homes in the past, you know, 18 months have been really working on overdrive. Um, We talk a lot about how our home has become the center of activity in a way that probably none of us had ever expected it would be. You know, it's our place of entertainment. It's our place for working out, for taking care of ourselves, for work. Um, You know, if you have kids for childcare, I mean, it's just, it's really checking a lot of boxes right now, which is... um, intense (laughs) and it makes makes the need to be comfortable even that much more important absolutely a hundred percent we have like this problem at the moment with our mattress and we've we're on to the third or fourth mattress that we're trying and it's just been such a disaster not having that like clear amazing sleep every night and it's driving me absolutely insane (laughs) and it's like We have all the other corners of the house sorted except the mattress, which to me is like the most important thing. I was about to say it really is the most important thing. It's the foundation to all things comfort in your home. I always say that if you really, really care about your sleep experience, you have to think about the mattress. 100%. I've never had a bad experience in my life. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know just disaster after disaster. But anyway, I digress. (laughs) Let's go back to the early beginnings, uh, circa 2014, when you were getting started with the brand. What was kind of getting you excited about working in this space? And where does the actual, you know, where does the story start? Yeah, so I've been um, really obsessed with home and interior design for as long as I can remember. And um, I think, you know, it really started... Um, quite earlier than when I actually launched the business um, in 2006, um, when I started an interior design blog. Um, and I was helping friends decorate their homes for fun. So becoming a super consumer in the space, shopping all the time, really, you know, getting um, getting a better sense of what the market looked like and what products were available to purchase. Um, I was working in advertising at the time um, that I was like starting to really come up with the concept of parachute. But um, I had reached a point in my career where I I was really wanting to have a more bigger impact in the work that I was doing. Um, I was feeling a little bit discouraged by um, the big agency world and um, wanted to be in a smaller environment. Like I said, have a bigger impact, really, um, really do something that I was very passionate about. And so I had one of those aha moments that you know, many people have when they're getting ready to embark on this kind of journey um, where I realized, you know, I'd spent all this time learning how to build brands and connect with customers and figure out how to motivate and inspire them. But then I also was really passionate about home and design. And um, it was something that, you know, I was good at and people were looking to me for advice. And, um, you know, and so I, I thought, why not merge these interests? And, you know, if not now, when? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so was this in 2006 or this was closer to 2014? No, this was closer to the launch. So, you know, started this blog in 2006, worked in advertising. Um, that's when I was in grad school and then worked in advertising for many years and then, um, you know, made this decision that I was going to do something more entrepreneurial, um, you know, kind of by, I would say, mid-2012. And um, by early 2013, I had left my job and had this idea for Parachute um, somewhat baked, but, you know, it took a while to get to to fully baked. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. Okay. So you leave your job before you've kind of even gotten started. Can you talk to us about those very early days? Like what gave you the courage to be like, okay, I'm going to go all in. And what were those early steps to going all in? So, you know, I often say that that was probably one of my mistakes that I made early on. Um, I was so passionate about this idea and so overwhelmed with this idea that I was, you know, less engaged at work. And I was all of a sudden, you know, like finding myself, you know, in like endless, like, like just like trying to read and talk to people. And I was just, I was very distracted from what I was 
actually supposed to do and what I was being paid to do at my job. And so, you know, I had a pretty idealized version of what starting a business would look like. I thought I would, you know, I have an idea. I would raise money. I'd be able to pay myself in a few months. Like it was just going to like all fall into place very seamlessly, which of course never happens. But I decided, um, you know, I was living in New York at the time. I had, you know, been thinking about moving back to Los Angeles where I'm from. And so things just started happening. I just decided, you know, I want to, I'm going to raise money. I'm going to start this business. I want to move back to LA. And it felt like, you know, why not throw my entire life up in the air all at once and just um, see where it lands. But, you know, when I look back at those times, I definitely did not need to leave my job that early. Um, You know, I was in the the very early ideation stage. um, And, you know, there was there was definitely enough time in the day to be thinking about, you know, to have a full time job and be kind of conceptualizing what this business was going to look like. But, you know, you live and learn. Um, and so I, I left my job in, in February. And um, within the month, I was in Europe visiting factories um, to see how these products were made, to meet with potential manufacturers. I was putting together like the framework of a pitch deck and a business plan, um, which I'd never done before. So it was quite comical and, you know, not so buttoned up and polished, but, um, you know, it was helpful to kind of just put numbers down on a page and, and start thinking about what this actually looked like. And I did have a few friends who, you know, were mentors throughout this time for me too, and had, you know, been in early stage companies and had started their own companies. And so they were really helpful in guiding me on this path. <laughs> And did you go out and raise straight away or did you bootstrap for a while? What was the kind of funding and financing path in those early years? So I did have an early investor who um, essentially paid for my trip to Europe as as like kind of an early investment and um, and got a few friends to invest. So this little group of friends put together, put in about, gave me about $30,000. And so that was sort of the first amount of funding that I had that allowed me to go to Europe. It allowed me to start building a website. Um, and then I joined an accelerator program close to the end of that year. So end of 2013. And with that capital, I was able to buy my first round of inventory and get the business up and running. Up and running. Ish. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. (laughs) When you think back to that time, what were the kind of hurdles that you were going through to get the brand into the world? Oh my gosh, just about everything. I mean, the highs and the like highs and lows could happen in the course of a five minute period. You know, there were moments where I was felt so confident, so empowered by this decision to leave my life behind and to build this business. And I felt so much enthusiasm and passion for what I, you know, knew could be something special. And then, you know, a minute later, I would be completely overwhelmed with all the decisions that I had to make. I was completely overwhelmed with, you know, how to, how to import products and how to get boxes and how to, you know, get late. I mean, just like everything was, I was in over my head. I mean, I had never worked in retail before. I had never worked in, you know, design or manufacturing. I mean, everything was new to me. And so the to-do list was, was so endless. Um, And so I, you know, I was, I had, I had some really hard days um, and I was a team of one. So, you know, I had moved back to Los Angeles and left this life that I had built for myself in New York for almost 10 years and, you know, felt very alone and didn't have a partner to do this with. So I felt just like the weight of the world, it seemed on my shoulders, finding a network, finding people to talk to, and and then, you know, ultimately joining this accelerator program where I was then surrounded by other people who were also trying to get businesses off the ground. Um, really helped (laughs) um, me feel less alone. You're saying so many things that resonate with me at the moment. Like I'm in the process of building a non-alc wine company and I've never done anything in the beverage space before. I don't know about, you know, shipping glass bottles across, you know, the world and all these different things that I'm starting to learn and just be like, oh my God. And I'm constantly saying to myself, like, what am I doing? This is so tricky and so overwhelming and you have to... take a step back and just be like, okay, one step at a time, like just focus on what is today, what is tomorrow. And everything that you're saying gives me hope. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's so much about, you know, you, you have these, 
like when you have this like really, you know, 3000 mile view, you know, you like look at everything that needs to get done. And it's, you know, if you can kind of map out what needs to happen on a daily basis or a weekly basis and set more achievable goals, you know, it starts to become more manageable. But yeah, I mean, I was way, way in over my head. Um, And it, you know, and I think what I learned from that experience, which has, um, you know, been one of my strengths is I really was able to identify, you know, what my strengths were and where my weaknesses were and what I needed to learn and what I could learn on my own and what I really needed to hire for and like who I needed to surround myself with in order to be successful. And since the beginning have had a real self-awareness around what I'm good at and and what I'm not, you know, and what I can bring to the table and, and where I want to learn from others. And so I have not been shy at all when it comes to asking for help. And I always share that that's, you know, so important when I talk to people that are kind of in the earlier stage of this process, like being vulnerable and saying I need help is like so not a weakness. It's a strength because um, ultimately it gets you further along the process. For you, who were those kind of early hires that were able to kind of um – offset like your skills and your strengths? Sure. So um, I really focused my early hires around finance, operations, planning, and and some content creation. Um, We were able to outsource things like web design and and marketing a bit at the early stages. Um, But really, you know, I hired people with a lot of financial and kind of operational backgrounds because I, I absolutely did not have that experience. And I felt way more confident in my ability to tell the story and be creative and think about marketing tra- tactics and design products, even though that was also new to me. But I had a real aesthetic passion um, and, and a point of view there. But I definitely leaned on people um, and hired people who uh, could you know, build models and think about planning allocation and just like think about how to get the products from point A to point B, you know, how to get the lights up and running in our first office, you know, like how to start get a distribution center going. In those early days, it's important to hire people that are um, flexible and are happy to wear many hats and, and, you know, get their hands in lots of different parts of the business. And, And it's such a great learning experience too. But yeah, I definitely, my background is was not in anything that had to do with numbers. And so I knew that that would be a big part of, of Sounds like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was really where I focused my first hires, people that could really make sure that the business was running smoothly. I'd love to talk about that early time, kind of like around launch into the first few years and what you were doing to kind of prove out the concept to the market and find your first customers that were outside of your immediate friends and family. Yeah. So, I mean, I started my career in PR and I really did believe that using press to tell a story um, was a really powerful tool. Again, this is like almost eight years ago. So Instagram was not where it is today. And, you know, the landscape looked quite differently. You know, we had limited resources from a capital perspective. And so um, I decided to invest in PR um, as our first kind of marketing strategy because I knew that those beginning days, people love telling that story. Um, and there's a real appetite for these new businesses that are doing things differently, at least at the time. You know, the direct-to-consumer world was relatively fresh and um, and there weren't a ton of businesses that were operating in that space and with that model. So I really relied heavily on PR um, and, you know, that kind of organic media that was happening to tell our story and to to reach new customers. And so we would get, you know, a, a press hit in, in various publications and blogs, and we would see, you know, some of them would just spike sales and, you know, we get all this traffic and, you know, those were like our, our key events in the first year that allowed us to reach customers because it was, it was a really new concept then. And so people were very, you know, what we kept hearing for customers is that, oh, I've been waiting for a brand like this. Like, you know, there's all these places to buy sheets and towels, but they're mostly furniture stores and these products are really an afterthought and they're not high quality and they don't, you know, look new and fresh and modern. And so, um, you know, people were excited to excited. Yeah. To have a have a new brand in the mix. Mm-hmm. And how has that evolved over the years in terms of like what are your kind of key milestones when you look back that leaped you forward or kind of propelled the brand into what it is today? It's a good question. I mean, I think it's been, there's been a few different things. I mean, introducing new products have been really big for us. I mean, we 
I knew from the beginning that I really wanted to build this home lifestyle brand. And so I knew that we had to, you know, expand our assortment to be in many rooms of the home um, in order to create that lifestyle feel. Yeah, I think introducing new products um, were big milestones for us and gave us a lot to talk about, as well as introducing our retail stores. Um, We now have 13 stores and um, are opening quite a few more, but those early stores um, also were big milestones for us, allowed us to connect with the community and really think about how we build relationships with our customers in a different way. Yeah, I would say, you know, as a really product focused business, products have been really important milestones that have helped us, you know, kind of get to the next level. Mm, And increase that lifetime value, like for one customer over time because they already trust you, they already know you. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, it actually took us about two years before we moved out of the bedroom um, into the bath. And so in that two years, we had established, you know, a small but loyal customer base and those customers were wanting more. And so we gave them what they wanted. (laughs) Gave them what they wanted. I've read something crazy like you're introducing 30 more stores or something insane by the end of next year. That's crazy. Yeah, we are really doubling down on retail. We should have about 30 total by the end of next year, um, or maybe a few more if we can do it. But yes, we we really see an incredible halo effect. So, you know, the, the way that um, we see people shopping online in areas and in neighborhoods where we have stores is really quite important. And we see people that want to browse in store and then shop online. Feel the fabrics, check it out and then go and buy online. Yeah. And we, you know, we offer appointment shopping and we um, do some like different kind of services like buy online, pick up at store. And so, you know, we're trying to think about how we can create the best shopping experience for our customers, depending on how they prefer to shop, um, especially, you know, given the past 18 months um, and how things have changed. When you look at your marketing mix now, you know, with the introduction of platforms like TikTok, what are the kinds of things that are like really working for you that are kind of like, uh, like undervalued and, you know, when we think about Facebook and Instagram ads and this kind of thing, it, everyone's saying, you know, customer acquisition costs are going up. Ads are getting so much harder after the iOS 14 updates. Are there any channels that you're like leaning into more because they're a bit more under the radar, undervalued? Um, You know, we over the past, I would say two years really got more excited about kind of more traditional channels. So things like our catalog have been very successful. Um, We also are now doing some more streaming TV and, and kind of video. I would say that pretty early on, I identified just how important it would be to have a diversified marketing mix and, you know, was very concerned about being too dependent on any given channel. Um, And so we have... We have, we have done that over the past, you know, many years now. We have not been impacted as much on the iOS uh, changes um, because we just weren't as heavily dependent on Facebook as a channel. But yes, um, I would say that, you know, and this is not new news, but a lot of the traditional channels are, are working really well for us. And, you know, especially we think about the most effective channels being channels where we can tell our story. And so a lot of those channels lend themselves to some really beautiful storytelling. Do you think it's also because besides the storytelling factor, because I so see that, do you think it's also because those places are less crowded now or they're just as crowded as before, but it's just truly where your audience is and that's why it works so well? So if you had said six months ago, I probably would have said they were less crowded um, and I think they were also where our customers were um, or are. I think they're getting really crowded and so we're thinking about, you know, how do we evolve our catalogs so that they stand out more? Um, because, you know, there's these catalog drop days um, in the U.S. And, and we, I mean, my, my mailbox, is, I, you know, it's like all of a sudden I've got a stack of catalogs. And, and it's hard to stand out, you know. And I think when there's such, like, significant penetration in, in one channel, you, it, there's a lot of noise and catalogs become you know, quicker to dispose and to toss. So a lot of people are starting to move towards these more traditional channels now. So I think the secret's out. (laughs) You know what I would love to receive as a catalog? And I'm just thinking out loud here is like, because I receive a lot of catalogs too, right? And you're like, oh yes, you know, same, same, like whatever, all looks the same. 
not looks the same in terms of the actual content inside, but like pieces of paper. Imagine if you just sent like mini sheets, <laughs> like of your best fabric or something with like a little letter or something on it. I would love to receive, especially because I love sheets and like I love things that feel good. But if someone sent me like a really beautiful piece of fabric and was like, these are, the, these are what our bed sheets are made of, I reckon I'd be like, where do I get that? Sign me up. <laughs> that would be so fun and so random. Um, I wanted to ask you, obviously the landscape has changed so much between 2014 to today. If you were starting this business again tomorrow, what do you think you would do differently in terms of like spend more money here and less money there or like not waste money there and that kind of thing? Oh, that's a tough question. I mean, there's so much I would have done differently. Um, I think the the way that you can build awareness about your brand before you even launch a brand is so powerful now. I think I probably would have spent a lot more time getting creative with just content um, and getting the word out, you know, before I even launched a product um, to build that interest and intrigue and to kind of drum up some excitement about the launch. I, I'm pretty pumped with how this business has been built. And so, you know, in, in many ways, I also feel like it it unraveled and unfolded perfectly. That's not to say there weren't a million mistakes made along the way. The goal has always been how do we build deeper relationships with the customer and how do we create trust um, so that our customers are, you know, loyal and 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 turn to us for both advice and inspiration and education and and we become like an important part of your home. And so I'm sure there are other ways that we could have invested and, you know, I think Early on, um, just to give one kind of example of mistakes, I mean, early on, and maybe this isn't a mistake, maybe this is just kind of the way it has to be, but, you know, we we did various, you know, we after I raised a first real round of capital, you know, one of the things our investors encouraged us was to spend real money in marketing channels to see what worked and what didn't work. And, you know, some of the channels totally bombed. And, and I think that um, if I had to do it again, I, I maybe would have been a little bit more cautious with how I was testing and um, because, you know, it is important to see what works and what doesn't work, but I think you can do so in ways that are also not. A smaller test. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Somehow. Yeah. I mean, I think you learn so much from, you know, the mistakes you make and, you know, my biggest lessons have been in times where you've had these like really challenging times and, and, and challenges to overcome. And I always try to reframe every mistake or every challenge as an opportunity because it really is, you know, as cheesy and cliche as that sounds, like that's where we grow and that's where we've learned the most about our customer. That's where we've actually been able, you know, it's like when you're able to improve and evolve and and to see just like how much you can constantly be pushing yourself to do better. I think the customer feels that too. And, and people really admire that as a business tactic versus just, you know, focusing on growth all the time. 100%. So true. You said something a moment ago around, you know, really focusing on building loyalty with your customers and creating deep connections. And this is probably a really stupid question, but like, how do you actually do that? How do you focus on building those connections and, and making a customer stay loyal with you over the years? So there's a few ways that we think about doing it deliberately. Um, one is on our social channels. So just being, you know, having a conversation and a dialogue with our customers on those channels so that we can get to know them and, you know, encourage sharing and just, you know, there are so many ways that you can actually have a conversation with um, with customers online um, and, and in our retail stores too. Pre-COVID, we hosted a ton of events or workshops and speaker series in, in all of our stores and, and those stores were really very alive um, and, and designed to be so much more than just the transaction. And so we got to know a lot of our customers intimately in that way. And that was also really awesome and, and really fun. You know, I personally tried to, you know, go to conferences and do speaking engagements and try to just like get to know people as much as I can as well. But when we think about the content that we create, whether it's, you know, on our blog or in our social channels, it's really around this lens of how do we be both educational and inspirational. And I think that's what people are looking for and it helps build that relationship. But, you know, we focus so much on making sure that we're putting the best product out there. And I think that that consistency is also how you build trust and loyalty if you're not able to have, you know, a real in-person connection. But, you know, we take 
all of our customer experience interactions really seriously. We've got an amazing team there, you know, that's so helpful and able to, you know, just get our customers what they need and what they want. Um, and people, you know, the bar is set so low, unfortunately, um, because there's so many negative experiences, both online and offline, you know, however we can surprise and delight and, and, you know, make people feel good is that's the goal. And I feel like that's a really big one that gets forgotten just so much of the time is like how much bad customer service there are from certain brands out there and how much they're like the lack of surprise and delight. Like it actually shocks me sometimes when, you know, sometimes you just receive like a a bad experience and you're like, but how, like, how is this, you know, 2021, like, why aren't you doing more to surprise and delight and to keep those um, loyal customers loyal? Blows my mind. Huge opportunity (laughs) for everyone listening. Yep, absolutely. I know. It is a huge opportunity. Yeah, it is. And it, it, you know, I think, you know, a little goes a long way when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I think it's just, it's just, You know, and I think it's also important, though, for customers to remember that there's real people sitting on the other side of the screen um, as well, you know, and and like being kind um, and thoughtful in terms of how you engage with brands is also really important. One hundred percent. What do you think is important advice for female entrepreneurs coming into 2022? I mean, I think it's, I think there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. We can talk about being a female entrepreneur, but, you know, female led companies and women led companies are, are really just doing so tremendously well, both in the private and public markets right now. I'm so inspired by so many um, female leaders and and entrepreneurs. Um, But, you know, I think there's there's so much appetite for for new shopping experiences for new types of brands for new ways to connect i i encourage people to to try and to or not try to do um and to really make make things happen and make magic happen i'd also say you know focus on building a strong network and reach out to people that you think can be helpful. Um, because one of the things that I've been consistently impressed and just, you know, inspired by is, um, especially female founders are their willingness to, to be helpful and to take a call and, um, to respond to an email. hundred percent. Thank you so much. I love that. We wrap up at the end of every episode with a series of six quick questions, some of which I might have asked, some of which I might not have, but I ask them all the same at the end. So question number one is, what's your why? Why are you doing what you're doing? Because I love sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> How many hours of sleep do you get a night? Uh, not enough. I've got two kids under three. What's my why? Um, to create a, a comfortable home, but um, and also to... Uh, to show my kids just what's possible when you dream. I love that. Question number two is, what do you think has been the number one marketing moment that's made the business pop? Well, um, if you go way back when to 2014, right after we launched, we had a very small mention in the Wall Street Journal, which drove an incredible amount of traffic and sales and was like the gift that kept giving for years. So I would say that that was a huge turning point for us. Um, Little blurb. (laughs) A little one, not a big one. No, it's a small blurb. Love that. Question number three is where do you hang out to get smarter? What are you reading or listening to or subscribing to that's worth mentioning? Oh, not enough, to be perfectly honest. Um, I tend to only read books when I am like away from life and on a vacation, which also doesn't happen nearly as much. Um, I'm trying to listen to more podcasts, um, but, you know, I would say that on a day to day basis, um, I'm reading The New York Times. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Amazing. Me too. And some blogs business blogs. And right now I'm actually really trying to educate myself in the public market. So I'm like reading a lot of um, interesting, you know, blogs and um, coverage over the public markets and digging into S1s and things like that. Question number four is how do you win the day? What are your AM and PM rituals and habits that keep you feeling happy and successful and motivated? Uh, quality time with my kids, um, working out and, uh, long walks. Love a long walk. Nothing clears your head better than a long walk. Yes, I agree. Or anything in nature, I guess. 
I miss more nature. I miss the Australian nature in London. London's a bit of a tough one for me. Question number five is if you were given a thousand dollars of no strings attached grant money, where would you spend that in the business? And it's kind of to highlight your most important spend of a dollar because I know it's not a lot of money. <laughs> Take my team out to pizza. <laughs> Love it. Team bonding. Team bonding. So important. And last question, question number six, how do you deal with failure? What is your mindset and approach when things don't go to plan? Um, I, I like to feel it, you know, I identify the feelings that I'm feeling. I try to recognize that those are okay feelings to have. And then I try to problem solve and and figure out how to reframe that feeling of failure into something that's positive, um, so that I can keep, keep the, keep the show going. Keep the show going. Ariel, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today and share your learnings and your journey so far with Parachute. I'm excited to see what happens next. Thank you so much. My pleasure.